there's a place near to me where my longing to be with my friend at the old
join me in reading Psalm 145 responsibly, verses 10 through 18. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. To make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are called and raises up all who are alive and The eyes of all look to you, and you give them food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. When we gather to praise God, we remember in truth that we are people who have preferred our will to his, accepting his power to become new persons in Christ, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, Lord God. We confess in our hearts the wrongness of our ways, O Lord. Thank you. 
our hymn is number 56, God Will Take Care of You. Thank 
servant said, How can I accept this before a hundred people? So he repeated, Give it to the people and let them leave. For this says, For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. He said it before them, They ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. John chapter 6, verse 1 to 21. After this, this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing in the church. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip asked, answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, son of Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five early loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five early loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to take him out. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough, because the strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. And coming near the boat, they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts are pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When God spoke to Moses through the burning bush, and Moses asked God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of our ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. In the English language, just three letters are needed to declare the name of the Lord. I, A, M. Just two words, I, am. One complete sentence, I am. Basic English grammar rules say that a sentence must have a subject and a predicate. I am is complete. We can add a lot of words to the basic sentence to fill our need for more explanation. I, God, do exist. I have always existed. I do exist now and will continue to exist in the future. But 
God keeps it very simple. I am. That is all God's people need to know. No descriptors needed. Just that fact. God exists. Through God's holy word, we learn of the many attributes of God, adjectives that describe God as intimate, all-powerful, all-knowing, trustworthy, steadfast, loving, merciful, just, compassionate, holy, unchangeable. The list goes on. God simply says, I am. I am the one who gave my name to Moses and sent him back to Egypt to free the Hebrew people from slavery, and I promised to go with him on the journey. I am the one who led the people through the wilderness and provided for them, meeting all their basic needs, protecting them, and guiding them to the promised land. I am is the one to whom the psalmist addresses, saying, All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all the people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom and everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The psalmist acknowledged that the Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him in truth. The Lord spoke through the psalmist and through the prophets, such as Elijah, about whom we read this morning. Historically, Elijah lived around 800 BC and came from an agricultural region near the dense forests of the Jordan River Valley. He was working on the family farm when the great prophet Elijah came to Elijah to tell him that the Lord had chosen Elijah to take Elijah's place as a prophet to the kings of Israel. Elijah's years of service to the Lord were marked by war and famine. It is in this setting that the miracles performed by God through the prophet Elijah are recorded. The fourth chapter of 2 Kings, from which we read, opens with the story of a widow who is being forced by a predator to give her two children as slaves to pay for death after her husband died. Elijah said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? She answered, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. He said, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not just a few. Then go in, shut the door behind you and your children, and start pouring into all these vessels. When each is full, set it aside. So she left him and shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her, and she kept pouring. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. But he said to her, There are no more. Then the boy stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt and you and your children can live on the rest. With the help of her family and the community, God gave the widow the ability to, surprise, to survive the oppression of the debt collector. The woman did not seek help from a powerful king in solving her dilemma. Instead, she turned to the man of God. 
She gave the last of her resources, a jar of oil, in trust to provide for and protect her children. She participated in the miracle that God had in store for her. Not only did she participate, but so did her neighbors, giving her vessels she needed to fill with oil, in with this abundance from God. This chapter of 2 Kings ends with the miracle of feeding a group of hungry people with a few loaves of barley and fresh grains of ears, ears of grain. They are the first fruits of the harvest, we're told, the best that there is to offer. The servant intended the offering to feed the man of God in this time of famine. But God meant it as a provision for the hundred hungry people who were gathered there in this time of famine. Elijah trusted the word of the Lord who said, they will eat and have some left. And so it was. In each of the miracles and signs performed by Elijah, the prophet reported in 2 Kings, God provides for the needs of the people, resources to help them survive, clean water, abundant food, love and compassion and care for the community. These are the scriptures that the followers of Jesus would recognize in his teaching. The disciples of Jesus would know the miracles of Elisha and how God worked in the lives of ordinary people. People living on the margin of society. People who lived in fear of the war raging around them, the famine, the everyday stress of disaster. Jesus' followers also lived in such a time. A time when people were oppressed by the governing empire, when taxes exceeded wages, and families struggled to feed their children. The opening of the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John is reminiscent of the story of Elisha's miraculous feeding of the multitude of people. The number 100 is used in our translation. But really, it just implies a large number of people. A servant brought bows and ears of grain to the prophet, a small amount considering the large number of people. A boy, we're told, had brought food with him, a lunch for the day that he came to hear Jesus speak, and he offered to share what he had with all those around him. Jesus fed the crowd himself. He took the load, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who received it. He fed them miraculous, life-giving bread, even if they did not yet realize just what they were being served and by whom. When the people saw the miracle that Jesus had accomplished, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Verse 15, we read, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. I wonder about this last verse. I understand that Jesus would not allow himself to be taken for political reasons. He would not be used to promote or an overthrow of the Roman government ruling the land at the time. He was not that kind of king. The Messiah did not come to be used for narrow-minded human purpose or gain. But what I wonder is, why did the disciples left Jesus there? Of course, he might have made such arrangements with his friends before he left the mountain. 
But from what we read, it seems that the disciples leave behind the very one they profess to follow. It may be named. When Jesus has shown us his presence and performed a miracle in our lives, when God has given us a full belly, so to speak, and leftovers to spare to see us through our next bout of hunger, do we limit what God can do only by expecting a meager meal when he proves over and over again that he gives life abundance to those who love him? Do we take him away to a far mountaintop because we want to use him for our purposes only, rather than for God's purposes for us? Do we leave him on the shore and try to make it through the storm without him? And then, like the disciples, we become terrified in that storm. But Jesus, rather than condemning them for their fear, or rebuking them for leaving him behind, Jesus simply calms them with a phrase, I am, don't fear. I am, that most basic, simple statement. A complete statement in itself. Our, our translation reads, I am he, or it is I. But in the original Greek of the New Testament, it is, it was written with just two words. Ego, I mean. Two words that would make it clear to the disciples that Jesus was using the very words that Yahweh said to Moses. I am. Throughout the Gospel of John, he records Jesus' dialogue on many I am statements. I am the bread of life. As bread sustains physical life, so Christ offers and sustains spiritual life. I am the light of the world. To a world lost in darkness, Christ offers himself as a guide. I am the door of the sheep. Jesus protects his followers as shepherds protect their flocks from predators. I am the resurrection and the life. Death is not the final word for those in Christ. I am the good shepherd. Jesus is committed to caring for and watching over those in his care. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. He is the source of all truth and knowledge about God. I am the true vine. By attaching ourselves to Christ, we enable his life to flow in and through us. Then we cannot help but bear fruit that will honor the Father. But in this conversation with his followers, in the middle of a raging storm, all the disciples needed to know, Jesus said to them in two words, I am. Like my Father in heaven, I am, Jesus said, and you have no need to fear. The great I am is right here with you. To hold you, to protect you, to meet you where you are, and to fulfill your basic needs, to calm the raging storm, and so much more. But you must believe me, call on me, accept me, and participate with me. The disciples still had a lot to learn about Jesus. And so he got into the boat with them that night and continued to teach them just how much meaning was contained in those two little words. Let us pray. To the great I am, to him who was and is and is to come, to God Almighty, 
merciful, patient, and compassionate Father, loving Son, Holy Spirit, to God be all glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. What shall I return to the Lord for all who found me to me? I will give what I have promised in the presence of all God's people. Let us give with gratitude for the richness of the blessings we have received. Of 
we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son in the worship and glorify, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Holy Spirit, universal and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We dwell for the permanent resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You have heard the prayers of your people brought before you. Prayers for those who are grieving. For Don's family. And for the family of Reverend Rottmeyer. Lord, we give you thanks that we know they have gone to their eternal home with you, Lord. And for them, we are ecstatic. But, Lord, for those that they have left behind, we pray for your peace and comfort as you guide them through the days of sorrow. Help them to live through the grief, always drawing on your strength, Lord. We pray for those who are ill, ill of body, of mind, filled with disease of whatever sort, Lord. Help all of those who are in need of your grace and mercy. Help them to seek you first, Lord. Send others to be with them. To help them in your name, Lord. Send your message <coughs> to all who are suffering. Help them to reach out to you, Lord, that you might answer. Lord, we give you thanks for the families that you've given us, diverse as they are, each with our own issues, blessings, joy, concern. Lord, we pray that you be with us as we welcome visitors this summertime, as they travel to and fro, help us, Lord, to enjoy each other's company, to always remember that you are in our midst. Lord, help us to ask with loving kindness to all of those whom we encounter. Lord, we thank you that you have granted some among us long, long life on this earth. For adjustments are difficult as we get older. We pray, Lord, for all of those in whatever phase of life that are facing adjustments. These are those who no longer are able to do what they did in their youth and face and frustration. Be with those that are moving away from home for the first time. Guide them and be with them. <coughs> we pray, Lord, for all of those who enjoy the creation that you've given us, the beautiful land on which we live. Lord, it hurts our hearts when we see the fires raging, knowing that your creation is destroyed by fierce elements. Lord, protect those in the path of the fires. Be with them. Help them to see their way through this raging storm. Help them to rely on you, Lord. And more than that, Lord, help us to help them. Show us, Lord, we pray, where we're needed this day, this week. Help us as we go out into your mission field, Lord, to remember 
that you are the source of our being, that you are our neighbor. Help us to be kind to one another, compassionate and understanding. Help us, Lord, to look beyond the surface and what we see and to know that it is you who live in your heart. Lord, friend to a stranger, help us to welcome them. Lord, we thank you for the lives that you give us. Help us to live in gratitude, to share the bounty of our wealth, to see where there is a need and to reach out to fill it. Lord, among your people, there are prayers and needs and desires that we don't express to others, Lord, only between us and you. We do so now, Lord, in the time of our prayers. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be your people, to gather here together to worship you, Lord, and to pray together as Jesus Christ told us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth and in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is found only in your song sheet, Standing on the Promises. It's different than the version in the handbook, so you can use the song sheet. Please stand as you're able. Standing on the promises. <laughs>